Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone out to our Friends and Family Day here at the New Albany Church of Christ. I have one quick announcement on uh, classes this morning for our second hour of worship. All of uh, every class from 4 through 6 and up will stay in the auditorium. 4 through 6 and up will stay in the auditorium for our class period this in our second hour. For our opening song, let's sing number 694. <clears throat> To Canaan's land I'm on my way Where the soul never dies My darkest night will turn to day Where the soul never dies No sad farewells No tear dim Never die. 
Colossians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Would you pray with me? Our most wonderful Heavenly Father, Again, we come to you thanking you for this day that you've given us. Thanking you for this week that we've had with our lectureship and that I mean, it's our prayer that much has been gained from it and that uh, we will try to live some of the lessons or all the lessons that have been taught to us and uh, that we'll come closer to you and, and much will be gained from it. Uh, as we enjoy our, our friends and family day to day, please be with us and those that have traveled from afar, that we will give them a safe return home as when this day is over. I ask a special blessing on all our speakers we've had this week and the, those that are to come this morning, that you would be with them, give them ready recollection of the things that they prepared, that, uh, again, that much will be gained from it. I ask a special blessing on those that in our prayer list that are undergoing treatments and are, are not able to be here because of health issues, that you would be with them and return them to a much wanted place of health, again, to be thy will. Be with those who may have lost loved ones this week and bless them in a way that only you can. Also ask a special blessing on our leadership here that uh, our elders and deacons and others that are working in the church here that uh, that they would uh, work in your service and that uh, many more people will be added to your kingdom. Go with us in everything that we do. All these things we ask in your son's name. Sing number 839. Convenient, let's stand. 839. What a song of delight in the city so bright will be wafted deep heaven's fair door. How the ransom will raise happy songs in his praise when all of God's singers get home. so good to see you all here this morning, especially our friends and families who have joined us this morning for this very special day. Uh, we have had a, a tremendous weekend with some wonderful speakers, 
And as we close out the weekend's festivities with our Friends and Families Day today, and as we glorify God together, we're thankful to be together here this morning. Thankful to have Brother Mark Reynolds with us this weekend, as well as his wife Mindy. Uh, Mark and I have known each other for many years. I love him and his preaching. I love his, just, just who he is, uh, and his soundness, his love for the truth, his love for others. Uh, they have to leave quickly uh, to get home to beat all the RVers who will be camping out in his driveway as the eclipse passes right over their house in Muncie, Indiana. Uh, Mark is from Muncie, Indiana, uh, originally from the Town Acres congregation. Uh, I believe his dad preached there for <coughs> He preached at Yorktown, or West, again, yeah, in Yorktown, but it's home. And, uh, and he preached in South Carolina before coming to Memphis, and he did preach here in Mississippi while he was at the Memphis School of Preaching uh, for three years, uh, and then moved back to uh, Memphis and was the preacher at Forest Hill Church of Christ in, in Memphis for three years before returning home. Uh, but we're glad uh, that Mark and Mindy were able to be here with us this weekend, and Mark is here to speak to us this morning. Before we begin, I just want to tell you how much Mindy and I have enjoyed being here. Uh, you know, you go different places, and, and uh, sometimes, you know, it, it's always good to visit other places, but sometimes you feel like you've known people for quite a while, even though it's just been a couple days, uh, and that's how it is here. And you all make it very easy to get to know you, just so down to earth, so hospitable. Um, uh, Tim has bragged on you, and I can see why he does that. Uh, it's a good congregation. So happy for uh, Tim and Colleen to be here with you, and I'm happy for you to have them here. I don't have to tell you, um, you know, not every congregation is, is, is blessed with great preaching, uh, but you are, and I'm so happy for you, but I'm happy for them as well that they have a home, uh, people who love them, and they love you as well. It's just good to be a part of this. We've really thoroughly enjoyed ourselves uh, this weekend. In our whole lectureship that we've been able to enjoy, and Tim and whoever else had a part in this and planning it, uh, the topics have just really built on one another, and it just seems like every time somebody's preached before me, they just set me up for, for my lesson, and uh, that's, that's great. Uh, but today, we're looking at friendship evangelism, and what a better day to speak on this than your friends and family day. Uh, we're going to be talking about this, and I want us to start in our text where we uh, started this morning, Colossians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. This is going to be the theme of the lesson, although we're not going to spend much time, just going to say a few things about this passage. And I've underlined some words, highlighted them so that you can see what I wanted to emphasize from Colossians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, where it says, Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. That's one of the greatest evidences of the inspiration of the Bible, is how you can get so many truths and just one little sentence or two sentences, uh, so much information is packed there. But it's all there in that about walking in wisdom. The Christian life is a Christian walk. It's progression. It's going forward. Uh, it's never standing still. It's never going backwards. You always want to walk. You always want to go forward. You always want to progress in your Christian faith, which we've heard over and over and over again this weekend. And the reason we've heard that over and over and over again is because we need to be reminded of that from time to time. But walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, those who are outside of Christ. Be wise in your dealings with people who are outside of Christ. And then this phrase, redeem the time. When's the time to start being concerned about those outside of Christ? Right now. Yesterday. Right now is the time to be concerned about those who are outside of Christ. But then as you approach them, let your speech be seasoned with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how to answer each one. You know, you don't have to be ugly to be sound in the faith. And I know that you know that. You don't have to be rude. You don't have to be mean. You don't have to be hateful. As a matter of fact, all of those go against what this passage is teaching. 
We are all concerned about those who are outside of Christ. How is the best way to deal with them? Well, this passage tells us, let it be with grace. Season your words with salt. That's not talking about not telling them what they need to hear. But as you tell them, as you share with them, think about it before it comes out of our mouths. So that we may know how to answer each one. Relationship evangelism focuses on building intentional relationships with non-Christians that grow into spiritual relationships because you are able to have an influence on them with the gospel of Christ. And when we think about this passage, notice that we are to walk with them. To walk with them. Use our words in a gracious way, but walk with those who are outside of Christ. It's our understanding, and, and this is abrupt. I realize what I'm getting ready to say is abrupt, but it's true. It's our understanding that those outside of Christ are dead in their sin. They're blinded by Satan. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 tells us that they're enemies of God, lovers of darkness, under God's wrath. And we know this is true because each of us have been there as well, haven't we? There's been a time when each of us were outside of Christ and these things were true about us as well. The lovers of darkness under God's wrath, no hope for the future. But then somebody took some time to walk with us who seasoned their words with grace, gently taught us the gospel, and now we went from being outside of Christ to inside Christ, in Christ. And we're thankful so thankful for that. There's three things I want us to notice this morning. This is going to be a very practical lesson, a very simple lesson. But don't confuse simple with non-important. This is profound. And the reason it's profound is because uh, we're going to see it just taught all throughout the New Testament. But there's three things I want us to do. I want to just briefly, in our first point, mention its effectiveness. That is, relationship evangelism. We're going to show that it's been effective. Yes, that might be a catchy phrase, relationship evangelism. We may not see those words exactly in the New Testament, but we see it all throughout the New Testament, this relationship evangelism. So we're going to just briefly look at that. And then second, we're going to get an idea of what it means for us. Okay, we're going to see it in the Bible. Now, how, do, how, does, that, how does that affect me? What's it mean for me? And then third, and our final point, we'll just make some practical application to put these things into practice. I wanted to show you nine places in the New Testament, some New Testament examples. I think I've got about nine of them, and we're not going to spend much time in any of these, but I just want to get our attention to show that this is exactly what they did in the New Testament. In John chapter 1, remember it was Andrew who brought his brother to Jesus in John chapter 1. We know who his brother was, ended up being the apostle Peter, but it was Andrew who brought his brother to Jesus. Philip brought his friend Nathaniel to Jesus, again in John chapter 1, verses 40 through 51. Remember then the Samaritan woman. Uh, she's one of our favorites, isn't she? Because she's one who was really outside of Christ. There's no really outside. You're either in or you're out. But if anybody could be really outside, she was really outside. But Jesus took some time and talked with this woman, told her things about her life that no stranger could ever know. And she believed you're a prophet. And then she believed that he was Christ. But it didn't just stop there with her. Once she learned who he was, we know what she did, don't we? She went, this heathen woman, if we can say that, she was a heathen woman. She went and she evangelized her whole city. She went and she told all the people to see, well, why? Because once you know who Jesus is, if you can keep that to yourself, there's something wrong with your faith. Oh, that's a big phrase, I know. But if we can really know who Jesus is and decide, well, I'm just going to keep that to myself. Man, there's something wrong there. If you told me where the cure, that there was a cure for cancer but wouldn't tell me where to find it, how much of a friend would you be if I have a loved one that's affected by that dreadful disease and you've got the information to cure it and you won't share it with me? What did she do? 
Man, as soon as she found out who Jesus was, she went and told everybody she knew. Relationship evangelism. She couldn't tell the people she didn't know. So what did she do? She told the people that she knew. And then one of my all-time favorites, the man who had demons cast out of him by Jesus in the land of the Gerasenes in, in Mark chapter 5. You remember what he wanted to do. He wanted to follow Jesus. He wanted to go where Jesus went. And who could blame him? This, this is a man who lives by the, by the cemetery. He lives in the tombs. That's the only place he feels welcome in all the world. And he just has a miserable existence of a life. Jesus comes to him. He casts the demons out, as you remember, into the swine. And they go down the cliff into the sea. And the man says, well, I want to go where you go. Remember, Jesus said, you go home to your family. And what did he do when he was there? Matthew chapter 5, that tells us what he did. He went home and he told his friends what Jesus had done for him. He told his friends. Relationships. Those people that he knew, he couldn't wait to get home after Jesus told him, no, no, don't just go with me. You go home and you tell the people what I did for you. And he did just that. Why? He couldn't wait. To tell people he got his life back because of Jesus. Matthew invited his friends with him to uh, a dinner party. And the reason that he invited his friends to that dinner party is because Jesus was going to be there. And he wanted to introduce his friends to Jesus. And that's exactly what he did. Zacchaeus, what did he do? He invited many of his friends to a dinner party. Why? Because Jesus told him, Zacchaeus, I'm going to dine at your house. And so what does Zacchaeus do? Jesus is coming. I'm going to invite everybody I know. I'm going to invite a bunch of my friends. Why? So they can meet Jesus. Jesus was accused, as we know, of eating with sinners and tax collectors. And the reason he was accused of that is because that's what he did. <laughs> he was eating with them. He ate with them. That's a relational experience. He sat down. He had a meal with them. And then this great quote by Jesus, those who are whole don't need a physician, but those who are sick. Why was Jesus eating with these publicans, with these tax collectors, with these sinners? Because they needed him. They needed what he had to offer. And so he sat down, he had a meal with them with the intention of healing them, heal, healing their sin sickness in the only way that Jesus could. Peter spoke to Cornelius. He only talked to Cornelius. But when he got there, who was there? The whole household. Why? Because Cornelius had invited them. Peter's going to be coming here. He's going to be telling us about Jesus. I want everybody I know to be here. Why? Because he knows that's what they need. His whole household was baptized. Why was that possible? Because of Cornelius. He invited his friends and family to listen to what Peter had to say. And then another awesome one. Peter, or Paul rather, spent nearly two years talking with Felix. Acts chapter 23 and 24. He was sent to Felix the governor. And Felix had Paul guarded in Herod's palace. Acts 23 verse 35. Until he had the chance to hear Paul talk himself in Acts chapter 24. Well, after the hearing, Felix gave Paul some freedom. And you remember, he permitted his friends to take care of his needs. But Felix also got to hear about Jesus and the implications of being a disciple of Jesus. And these teaching conversations went on for a period for the next two years. Acts chapter 24, verse 27. While Paul was there, he didn't say, well, you know what, I'm in prison now. There's not much I can do here. I've done my job. It's time for other people to do their job. No, what did he do? If I can't come to you, come to me and let me teach you. And for two years, while in prison, Paul taught everybody who came to him. These are all examples of relationship evangelism. Relationship evangelism sounds like... Like a, like a fancy phrase or anything, but what it really just simply means is those people with whom you come in contact, those people with whom you have a relationship, it's your responsibility to teach them about the Lord. It's your opportunity and your responsibility to walk with them. It's your responsibility to choose your words with grace. Let your words be seasoned with salt. 
But make no mistake about it, it's your responsibility to teach those people that you know. And if we think about it, we just realize how much this makes sense. It's because I can't teach people I don't know exist. Well, it's at least it's very difficult. I guess I could put something out online. But what we're talking about is those people with whom we come in contact. You know, you'll come in contact with people I'll never know existed. And I'll come in contact with people you never knew existed. And if I don't teach them, how can you teach people you don't know? And how can I teach the people you know that I don't even know exist? And the answer is I can't. But I can teach the people with whom I have a relationship. You can teach the people with whom you have relationships. And the sad truth is, if I don't teach the people I know, then they may never get taught. So there's some examples of relational evangelism in the New Testament. <laughs> but this next point builds on this. If you have your Bibles, look with me to Luke chapter 10. <laughs> Luke chapter 10. People were always trying to test Jesus, and this is no exception. And that had to be just so frustrating, didn't it, for those people who were trying to test Jesus because he always won the argument. He always won the argument. But in Luke chapter 10, starting with verse 25, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, testing Jesus, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What's written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, Jesus said to this man, You have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. But now verse 29. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Boy, that's a loaded question. There in the first century, when Jesus was living, actually just before the B.C. on into the first century, one of the more prominent rabbis at the time was teaching, trying to get around, trying to find a loophole in the Old Testament law with just this man just quoted. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. The reason this man asked this question, because the common teaching at this time by the preeminent rabbi himself and then other rabbis took up his, uh, his words and, and began to teach it as well. When it came to your neighbor, your neighbor was only your fellow Jew. And that makes the story of the Good Samaritan all the more powerful, doesn't it? When they were talking, thou shalt love your neighbor as yourself. Well, who is my neighbor? These Jews who were trying to be faithful to the old law? They thought they found the loophole in that what that truly means is my neighbor is only my fellow Jew. Only my fellow Jew. That's as far as my responsibility goes is only that person who is my brother in Judaism, only my fellow Jew. That's the only one I have to love as I do myself. Well, that makes it a lot easier, doesn't it? If all I had to do was love the people who love me, that would make it a lot easier, wouldn't it? But what did Jesus do to turn that teaching on its head? He used a Samaritan man when the priest and the Levite walked by on the other side. Who was it that helped that man? It was a Samaritan man. And then you remember Jesus asked the question, now who was a neighbor unto him? Oh, man, you could just taste the sourness and the words that would come with it. He, he didn't say, well, I guess the Samaritan. That's not what he said. He said, the man who helped him. <laughs> Couldn't even honor the word Samaritan. Oh, they hated the Samaritan. Who was a neighbor unto this man? The Samaritan was. The Samaritan was. And so Jesus turned that teaching that only applied to your fellow Jew on its head. And so when this man asked this question, and who is my neighbor? That's a loaded question. 
And then Jesus goes ahead and he talks about the Good Samaritan. I read an article in preparation for this lesson. And I want us to answer this question for ourselves. We're asking what this means to me. And so I know there are probably no Jewish people here going by the old ball. Uh, and so I want to know this answer to this question for me, for you. What's the answer to this question? Who is my neighbor? Are they the people who look like me? Are they the people who think like me? Are they the people who act like me? Are they the people um, that I like? Or, or just who is my neighbor? And in this article, a man by the name of Jeff Wright told, me, told us that there's three kinds of neighbors. Three kinds of neighbors. Number one, you have your next door neighbors, your next door neighbors. These are people that you frequent by proximity. Anyone from the person sitting next to you on the couch to the person in your one block radius. That's pretty close, isn't it? Somebody sitting next to you on the couch. That's your next door neighbor. Somebody who, who may be in your own home, your wife, your husband, your children. Somebody who comes to visit. Within a one block radius, those people, because you got your next door neighbors. And then he talks about your nearby neighbors. And these are people that we see frequently by routine. These are the people in our usual spots. Uh, for a while, I fought the, and I don't know why I fought this, the dreaded thought of always being in a routine. You know, everybody likes to picture themselves as, you know, I'm up for anything, I'll do anything, and uh, I don't like to be in a routine. Well, that's, that's not true with me, and I, I finally come to admit that. Uh, but I am a routine-oriented person. But you know what? You probably are, too. You ever get in your uh, car, and Apple Maps will come and tell you seven minutes to Subway. I eat Subway a lot for lunch. And then I get in my car, I turn it on, it tells me you've got seven minutes to get there. And then I leave the office at a certain time and it tells me, I don't even ask it, it says 15 minutes to home. In the morning when I get in the truck, 15 minutes to Town Acres Church of Christ. And it pains me how accurate that thing is. I am a routine-oriented person on Monday nights. We get in the car after Mindy gets off of work, it'll tell us 25 minutes to Thai Smile. That's our favorite restaurant, Thai food. 25 minutes. So, man, I guess I am a routine-oriented person. But then you start thinking about it because of this, and then I start thinking about, you know, not only am I a routine-oriented person, but the people that I come in contact with, because I'm routine-oriented, I see them on a regular basis. Those ladies who serve me Subway, I see them several times a week. Our waiters at Thai Smile, we see her several times a week. We see these same people because we go to the same places and do the same things. How many times have we talked to them about Jesus? Oh, that question hurts. At least it hurts me because I know the answer. I see them routinely. Do I ever tell them the thing that they need to hear the most? Walking with them, saying it with grace, grace, let my word be seasoned with salt. Do I ever tell them the most important information they'll ever hear in their life? They're my neighbors. And then our natural neighbors. Our natural neighbors, Wright says, are those people with whom we frequent by intention. These are people beyond our neighborhood. You see them frequently and you share common ground with them. It might be the gym that you work out at. It might be uh, your workplace, the hobbies that you have, people who have the same interests with you. It's intentional because you do these things, you enjoy these things, and they do as well. And so you're all intentionally in the same place. These are people we frequent, our natural neighbors, we frequent by intention. You know, all of these people, all of these places that we frequent by intention 
have souls who need to hear the truth of the gospel. And if we don't teach them, who will? Who is my neighbor? Those are the three kinds, my next door neighbors. I gotta teach the people in my own home. I gotta teach the people within my one block radius, my nearby neighbors, my natural neighbors. And so with these three groups in mind, we need to understand the most important part. It's not just enough to know our neighbors. We need to love our neighbors. And it takes time to go from strangers to friends. That's not something that just happens. You know, when you were kids, you probably remember going up to a, another five-year-old and saying, Hi, I'm Mark. You want to be my friend? Yeah, I'll be your friend. It doesn't... It doesn't go that easily with the older we get. As a matter of fact, someone came up, hey, you want to be my friend? I thought, that, no. <laughs> You're scaring me a little bit. I don't even know you. Uh, this sounds like how a murder mystery begins. <laughs> so it's not quite as easy. And it takes some time to go from neighbors to friends, from strangers to friends. Here's some practical things I want us to think about. We're not to the last point yet, but let's think about some practical things. What it means to me. Those three people, next door neighbors, nearby neighbors, natural neighbors. Here's the best place to start. In your own mind and in your own heart. Start about by praying about the places you spend time and the relationships that you hope to build there. You know, when you start praying for something and you constantly pray for something, it just naturally makes you more aware when you get into a situation. Think about that. If I'm praying, okay, I'm going to this place. I know who I'm going to see there. Father, please help me have the courage. Give me the right words. Help my words be seasoned with, with, with salt. Uh, and help me show this person in, in a good and godly way. Give me an opportunity to teach them. And then give me the strength to take the opportunity. You start praying that prayer over and over and over again. And you think about specific people as you pray that prayer. And it's going to be hard for yourself when that opportunity comes to say no. Because you know you've been praying about it. And then you know God gave you the opportunity. And so now I'm not just saying no to myself. I'm saying no to God. And so pray. Start by praying about the places you spend time and the relationships you hope to build there. And then, rather than looking past our neighbors like they blend into the scenery around us, we must fight this tendency to run the risk of remaining strangers. And look for opportunities to show love to these three groups of people. Look for opportunities in your next door neighbor. Somebody die? What can you do to show them the love of Christ? Somebody have something great happen in their life. What can you do to show them the love of Christ? Somebody has a baby. What can you do? Look for opportunities in these places to show people the love of Christ. And then pray for those opportunities to show them to these three groups of people. Let's look at this third and final point now. You probably expected me to get here eventually. Well, not to disappoint you, here we are. The Great Commission. Go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always. Go and make disciples of all the nations. I want us to look at the intent of this. Here is a call for every Christian to be a soul winner. Here is a call for every Christian to be a soul winner. Go and make disciples of all the nations. We need to be intentional in our going. If you wait for the perfect opportunity to start teaching someone, 
that perfect opportunity may never come. Or at least you won't see it when it does. If I wait for a perfect business opportunity, I'm just going to sit here and wait for the chance for me to become a millionaire drops itself on my lap and it'll just show me exactly what to do and then I'll do it and I'll be a millionaire. Uh, that's not usually how millionaires are made. I don't guess. I wouldn't know. I've never made myself a millionaire, but I'm guessing that's not normally the way it's done. What do these people do? They think about it. They plan it. And then they do it. They're intentional in becoming the success that they want to be. Friends, that's how it is with soul winning. If you just sit back and you wait, God, bring this opportunity to me. What will either happen is that opportunity will not come or that God will bring it to you. But you're still waiting, and you're not looking for the opportunity, and you won't even realize the opportunity when it does come. So rather than sitting back and waiting for opportunity to come, be intentional in your going. I'm going to be a soul winner. Man, if every member of the church just started there, I am going to be intentional in teaching my neighbors. Those three groups that we talked about, I'm going to be intentional in doing that. If, if, if we all just started there, you think it would change things? It absolutely would, wouldn't it? So be intentional. But also, as you're being intentional to go places, to go and do, also notice the parts where Paul's missions were interrupted by arrests, or the needs of a local group of people where he stayed in Ephesus for a period of three years. Or his own imprisonments. So not only was Paul intentional to go. He went on all those mission trips. He did wonderful things. But when he was not able to go, what did he do? He stayed in a place, sometimes in prison, sometimes arrested. Sometimes there was a need in the local community, so he stayed there. But what did he do? While he was there, he looked for opportunities, quote, in everyday life. So be intentional. I'm going to go and teach somebody. But also, when those opportunities come up in every ordin everyday, ordinary life, pay attention and look for those opportunities and take advantage of those opportunities. And I believe those opportunities come to us every day if we're only just think about it and only be looking for it. You ever have a co-worker complain to you? No. Yeah, you probably do. And probably every day, don't you? There's opportunity there. They might be complaining about their family. They might be complaining about their job. They might be complaining about this, that, and the other. There's an opportunity to care. And there's an opportunity to show them some things that will help make their life more complete. Look for these everyday opportunities. What did Paul do? He taught the ones where he was. Think about Lydia, the jailer, Felix, in Rome, the other prisoners, the other guards. He taught the people where he was. Was. That's relationship evangelism. This question, you've probably seen this. I've seen it on Facebook and other places, but it actually started with a um, survey by the Institute for American Church Growth. As we think about taking the gospel to the world, we can't forget about the ones in our own community. We can't think, forget about our own neighbors with whom we come in contact. But this question was asked, what was responsible for your coming to Christ and the church? And this was an interdenominational survey. I mean, it covered all, but, but, but the truth is, would be the same in, in any denomination or the Lord's church. Uh, what was responsible for your coming to Christ and the church? And I know you've probably seen this, but it's it, it, good to see it again. I had a special need. 
2% of people came to a church of Christ because of that. I just walked in. 3% came to the church because of that. This next one hurts a little bit, but I'm glad it's double of I just walked in. I like the preacher. 6%. But you know what? Probably 12% leave because they don't like the preacher. So <laughs> this, this survey didn't tell us that. But I like the preacher, 6%. <laughs> I like his preaching. Preaching the truth is important. But you know what? With all truthfulness, that's not why people come to Christ. And that shouldn't be why they come to Christ. It should be because they love Christ. But I like the preacher. I visited there, 1%. I liked the Bible class, 5%. I attended a gospel meeting, 0.5%. And that's not saying gospel meetings aren't important because they are. That 0.5% is still a 0.5%, isn't it? I attended a gospel meeting. I like the programs, and people talk about that, and, and you see a lot of this in the denominational world to have bigger, better programs to attract people, and it works, but only 3% came because they like the programs, and you know where we're going with this. Why did you come to Christ and the church, and the overreaching result is a friend or relative invited me. 79%. Hmm. Hmm. Why is every building not full every Sunday morning? It's not the preacher's fault. Is it because perhaps we don't evangelize those with whom we have relations? What can you do? What can you do? Not only start inviting people, but look for opportunities to show Christian love. They will know you're my disciples how if you have the same love for one another. Show love to your neighbors. But don't just show love. Show them love in the best way possible by eventually sharing with them, teaching them the greatest news that has ever been announced on this earth and that is He is risen. We need to be intentional to evangelize those with whom we have relations. And if you are visiting here today on this Friends or Family Day, what a perfect day for this lesson. You are here if you're visiting with us because somebody loves you enough to invite you here to be with us today so that you could hear the truth of the gospel and perhaps make a life-changing decision to act upon that truth You've heard the gospel. Do you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Will you repent of your sins? Will you confess your faith in Jesus? Will you be baptized into Christ? Or maybe, you know, it's just been one visit. You say, ah, I'd like to know more, but I, I don't know enough. What a perfect time to set up a study. See one of the elders here. If you're, if you're a lady, if you want to rather study with a lady, see one of the elders' wives, see one of these ladies here. Get some more information. The Bible is an open book, and so are we. We would love to have that opportunity to teach you more about the greatest need that you'll ever have. And it can be fulfilled. We're going to sing a song of invitation. And we hope if there's anybody here that needs to obey the gospel, that you'll do that today. If we can help you in any way, let us know. We want to be your friend. We want to show you the love of Christ. Won't you come all together and stand and sing?
enough, prepare our minds to observe the Lord's Supper. We'll now sing number 621. We'll sing all four verses and then the chorus after the last verse only. They bound the hands of Jesus in the garden where he prayed. They led him through the streets in shame. They spat upon the Savior so pure and free from sin. They said, crucify him he. precious head they placed a crown of thorns they laughed and said behold the king they struck him and they cursed him and mocked his holy name all alone he suffered Gracious, loving, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this opportunity we have to be here today and worship Thee. And this time we can gather around this table, and as we do so, we just ask that you forgive us of any unforgiven sins that we might have, and remove all worldly thoughts from our mind, and let us dwell on that great sacrifice that you made for us. As we partake of this bread, which represents that body that hung on that cross, let us do so in a well-pleasing manner in our sight. In Christ's name, amen.
Let us continue. In like manner, Heavenly Father, we're thankful unto thee for this cup, the fruit of the vine, which to Christians represents the shed blood of our dear Lord and Savior on the cross of Calvary. Father, at this time, may we examine our heart and may we partake in a way that will be well pleasing in thy sight. It's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Let's pray together as we remember God's blessings upon us. Our Holy Father in heaven, we are so thankful unto you for this day, for this opportunity, for every blessing of life that we know comes from your hand. We're so thankful for the, the opportunities that we have to work, to make a living, to support our families, and to support the work of the church here. Lord, we pray that as we give back unto you a portion that, that you have given to us, we pray that we will do so and be acceptable in your sight, in Christ's name, amen. Certainly good to see everyone out this morning. At this time, we'll sing number 274. Could please stand? And then we will be dismissed with a closing, to our classes with a closing prayer. Remember that uh, 4 through 6 and up will stay in the auditorium. Found a friend in Jesus, he's everything to me. He's 
He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. The lily of the valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay. He tells me every care on him to roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Oh, he all my griefs has taken, and all my sorrows borne. In temptation he's my strong and mighty tower. I have all for him forsaken, and all my idols torn. From my heart and now he keeps me by his power. Though all the world forsake me, and Satan tempt me sore, through Jesus I shall safely reach the goal. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me here. While I live by faith and do his blessed will. Oh, all a fire about me, I've nothing now to fear. With his manna he my hungry soul shall fear. Then sweeping up to glory to see his blessed face where rivers of delight shall ever roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Let's pray together. Father, we are so thankful for all the blessings that you give us. We are thankful for the opportunity to come together and to worship, to study from thy word. We are thankful for those that have seen fit to come here and visit with us today. We ask that you watch over them as they continue on their way. We ask, Father, that you provide the things that we need to care for ourselves and others. And we're thankful for the doctors that tend to those that are ill. We ask that you especially bless them that they might return to their health that would provide them with the opportunity to be with us again. We ask now that you'd watch over us as we go from here and study further in classes and have another lesson. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs>